If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Heather, thank you so much for that amazing introduction to get the show going each and every week. And this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 286 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be a late night spectacular conversation with none other than comedian, comedy writer, showrunner, Eddie Feldman is here. That's right. Five time Emmy award winner. We're going deep. Tons of stories coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, Sal Rubinick, he was here last week. Do not miss that conversation. Star of Unforgiven, True Romance, Warehouse 13. So many great stories. Do not miss it, but do not miss this one. Last week, we talked a little deli, a little corned beef conversation. We're talking deli this week, too, with Eddie Feldman. You guys have been writing in more deli. I'm bringing you more deli. Pretty soon, this will be classic deli conversations. We're just testing the waters. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But we happen to talk deli in both these episodes. Anyway, we're also talking stories behind the Chevy Chase show. You don't know Jack with Paul Rubens. We're sharing our love of Paul Rubens. This was recorded before he passed away. Law and Order, Dennis Miller Live. So much right now. Enjoy. All right, everybody. I'm excited to introduce you to my next guest, comedian, comedy writer, executive producer. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Eddie Feldman. Hello. How are you, sir? I'm good. Oh, good. No complaints or a lot of complaints, but it doesn't do any good. So I say no complaints. This is a no complaint zone, Eddie. Yeah. We will not be taking mm-hmm. complaints. You've done a lot, and I want to talk a lot. You worked with someone who I, at one point in my my life, loved a lot, Dennis Miller, and I know you've worked with him three times. Yeah, um, I like. I love to hear a little bit about that. And you've won many Emmys. Excited to hear about that. But in your bio, it does say that you can make a great deli sandwich, and I did want to start there in terms of mm-hmm. what is your favorite deli sandwich. Both what is your favorite sandwich and which one can you make best is really what I, I want to get to the root of before we kick it. You know, I feel like we need to get that out of the way. Yeah, I'll take I'm happy to talk about that stuff. We lived above my parents' deli that was named Eddie's Deli in Sargadies, New York. So that's where I grew up and started working in the store since I was about I don't know, 10, maybe eight or so all the way through. And yeah, our, our specialties were uh, homemade salads, subs quite popular with well before Subway ever came around. So I would say on that note, the one that I think I made one of the best and then people always would come in for was my father would make homemade roast beef, special rolls, very simple, lettuce, sliced tomatoes on a slicer, not hand sliced, so they're thin. And then good old back east, Hellman's mayonnaise, best foods if you're out west of the uh, Mississippi. So that was a, a big thing. However, I would say Over the years of uh, seeing other people's sandwiches, so I'm in Santa Monica right now, and I would say uh, Bay Cities, well-known for the godmother, they're Italian, is probably one of the best go-to sandwiches out there. My favorite deli sandwich is, it'd be rye bread, lean corned beef, Mm -hmm. chopped liver, Russian dressing, and a piece of Swiss cheese. Ah, that's the yeah. old. Now, it's not something I could eat a lot because that's 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 a, that's a, that's going to take you down for the rest of the day. You know, I was living in Manhattan, and you'd go to some of the the big deli, the stage, or some of those places there. No, there's like it's a sandwich for four people. I mean, that was the the part of it. But yeah, we ours didn't lean towards that much meat. That you know, because that was a kind of a spectacle. So ours were the daily sort of come in, get your subs, fresh stuff, go home. So. As we were talking just before the show, you said something that blew my mind, was, which is your name is Eddie Feldman, but you're not Jewish, even though your family owned a delicatessen, you're from New York, and you're into comedy. It's like, this is a conundrum for me. I just, my mind was blown. <laughs> you're like, you're like, you're like, you have to buy every, every bullet of someone who's Jewish right there. Boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. 
<laughs> well, and you know what? Here's here's the thing: is like a lot of my friends who I've probably known for thirty, forty years, they'll think I'm Jewish, and I'm like, what am I going to say? No, I think the reality is my mother was Catholic, my father was agnostic. Maybe down the road there, his thoughts on you know religion was and God was. He believed in God, but he didn't think he had to pay a middleman to talk to him. So I would go to Catholic school, come home, and then he would go, hey, none of that is true. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, going up like that. As you were talking about the sandwiches, once you mentioned mayo, that, that was a kind of a tip off that maybe, maybe you weren't Jewish. Oh, yeah. Well, in that when you got, I mean, yes. Yeah. Well, for, again, but again, the golden rule of you would never have mayo on pastrami. I could be Cambodian. And that, and know that rule. <laughs> the bond, I could write, make uh, my living in the bond me area and never put mayonnaise on uh, pastrami or corned beef. All right. So you grew up uh, as a uh, Gentile deli owner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you grew up in New York. Where did you go from making sandwiches to comedy? How'd you make that jump? Well, uh, my first career, I have a degree in criminal justice. So and I went from having that before any comedy. I used to like to write as a kid. I would always write, you know, people would say it's funny. I memorized comedy albums and kind of spit them back. But after a, a short-lived couple of years in social work, realizing that I don't know if I can do this the rest of my life, I got talked into trying stand-up with some friends when I was visiting them in Virginia Beach. And I did like an open mic in Norfolk, Virginia while I was down there did okay, talked my way into unemployment at social work. So I was collecting money. And then I used that to go take the bus or train to New York City and start auditioning there. And then at the same time, I got into this comedy circuit all through the South, oddly enough, and started working the clubs there. And that kind of gave me a lot of stage time before I went back up to New York. So Work, actually, working with delinquent kids was a good sort of precursor for working in stand-up. And then with the criminal justice background, that probably helped with some of the Law & Order scripts that you wrote? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So, uh, again, I was out in the field. I would work, I was, uh, work with these delinquent kids who were taken out of jails in Massachusetts, put into foster homes. So I was kind of their caseworker. So I kind of, and again, my having a degree in it, I don't have a degree in comedy, I have a degree in criminal justice. So, and I was a huge fan of Law and Order. I watch it all the time to the point where my wife would go, it's on again? I'm like, yeah. And I ran into the executive producers of that show one time at a cocktail party for the WGA and mentioned them like, hey, I'm big fans of your show. And then I said, I, I go, hey, I had a couple ideas. Can I pitch them to you? And they're like, yeah, come on in. Tell us what you have. And pitched them this one idea. They liked it. And they go, yeah, why don't you write it up? And I, I go, okay. That was a sim it was one of those things that was as simple as that. You know, Thank God for a little alcohol because it helped get me uh, in writing in Law and Order. So that's how, it, that's how it came to be. And then I worked very much freelancing on my time off from Dennis Miller Live because it, it was only six to seven months a year. It gave me an interesting transition into the drama world. Who were some of the comedians of the albums that you listened to and memorized? Well, I think uh, definitely George Carlin, which wasn't even an album, but I, I remember I had it on cassette. So I, mem I had memorized that. And then years, it's funny because then years later, I, kind of, I uh, was, met him at the Emmy Awards and was talking. It was like, yeah, kind of that out of body experience. Like, oh, I remember listening in my room to cassette. And then I had won an award that year and sitting there with, you know, with Carlin talking about stand up. And I remember, always remember because, we, I brought it up about stand up and he looked at me and he said, um, he goes, yeah, stand up. He goes, yeah. he goes, it's a tough job, but I like the hour. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it definitely him. And then of course the other one I memorized and then my friends remembered was, uh, you know, Bill Cosby, of course, not knowing what Bill Cosby was all about then. I know a clue, at, you know, at 10 or 11. In fact, when I performed in front of a lot of my friends where I grew up, I had this my first show, they were all disappointed because they thought I was just going to go up there and do a Bill Cosby album. They were like, what about where's the Cosby stuff? I'm like, well, the idea is to write your own material because they remembered when we were growing up what I was doing. We all grew up on Cosby. I mean, yeah, if, yeah. You t if you take away our knowledge of right now for yeah. a second, but uh, Bill Cosby himself, ch the chocolate cake routine. 
I mean, there's, you know, yeah, nothing, okay. there's well, nothing funny. I mean, growing up on, that was on cable every five minutes you were watching that right. special with him just sitting there and you're mesmerized by it. It's it's sad where it all ended up. Yeah. But yeah, but that was a great, I mean, you, by watching those guys, I mean, listening to them, you know, Alan Sherman was another one that my son, the nut, when I, I was probably five or six when that came out. Again, that was kind of the musical comedy world of that. And at that time, that was about it for stand-up. There wasn't a lot out there other than you might see a little bit, you know, here or there. I mean, there was no real comedy clubs. People were performing in the hotels and the Catskills. But other than those, that, there wasn't a lot out there for you to see. We were just I was just talking today about somebody about Flip Wilson, you know, and would people even know who Flip Wilson is today or what was his what was his act like outside of television? I said, I don't know. I forget. I have to go back and see some of the forerunners of that. I have a whole cassette collection. And those listening who might be younger, that you're just going to have to Google what a cassette is. And uh, yeah. <laughs> as older folks that used to walk around with Walkman and, and our music on cassettes, it didn't come in from the, uh, from the internet. <laughs> but I used yeah. to have, uh, I had Joan Rivers, Rodney Dangerfield, I, you know, Bill Cosby also, you know. It's uh, I've got a whole pile of those things just sitting around. So you made you made the scene in New York doing comedy. Where when did you kind of sort of transition into writing? What what happened was making my four way into the New York. I mean, I grew up two hours north of New York City, but the idea of somehow going to New York City and uh, living there is really foreign to anybody who doesn't who doesn't live in New York City. I mean, it it was the place that we went to see plays and sporting events. And then we took the bus. The, took the bus home. The idea of living in New York and going there and trying to make a living like that stuff had no clue how to do that. So you know, I ended up staying with some relatives, auditioning at clubs. I had that experience in the South of working quite a bit in these comedy clubs. So I had an act, and then I also met a lot of New York comics who kind of helped me when I got up there and introduced me around and helped me get into some of the clubs. And then right around that same time. There was the kind of comedy boom that was happening. And so you could really make a, a decent living working just around New York City. And then uh, I got it, you know, somewhat traveling up to Vegas and stuff, but also I got in the college circuit. So that was a, I was able to make a, make a living and not have a day job or anything pretty quickly because it just happened when that boom was going on. How did you come to work with Dennis Miller so many times? Because your first big role was with was with Dennis Miller. Not your first writing job, but like your first like series. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then you worked with him three times. The original Dennis Miller show in the early 90s, Dennis Miller Live, which you mentioned, and then uh, the Dennis Miller show uh, in the mid 2000s. Yeah. Did you know him prior to this? Did you well, work with him? The first time I met him was at Catch a Rising Star, which was kind of the showcase comedy club in New York City that everybody you know went to. You know, there was the improv, Catch Rising Star, and the comic strip, really the three biggest ones. And you go in, and if you weren't working, you go hang at the bar. And one night, there's a guy there, and we're talking a little bit. And he asked if I was a comedian. And he, I said, yes. And he's like, he goes, well, I'm, hey, I'm auditioning for Letterman tonight. Do you come in and watch my set? You know, I'd like to see what you think and tell me how I went. I'm like, yeah, okay. And so I went in. He did this amazing six-minute TV-ready set that killed. And then he got left and he's like, what do you think? I'm like, well, I, I think you got the show. And if you don't, there's something wrong. So he got, he, he, he got the Letterman show that night. And then just because of comics, we, we, I didn't see him I, for, you know, either a couple of years until after it was on Saturday Night Live. And actually, you know, I remembered that day, that night that auditioned. Uh, what happened was uh, somehow I got teamed up with him. He was doing some colleges and uh, this guy... I knew said, "Hey, would you want to open for Dennis?" And, and I'm like, "Yeah, sure. Let's. I'd like to do that." And I started working at a couple of colleges. We really hit it off and friends. And he at one time worked at a deli, so we compared deli stories. And we actually took a walk to go get a sub. We were in upstate New York and kind of bonded. So I worked with him again. And then uh, we were watching TV or some sort of thing, and I made some joke about what was on TV, and he liked the joke and said, "Hey, I'm doing Letterman." Uh, next week, could I use that joke? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing Letterman, so go ahead. <laughs> so he does Letterman, that joke kills. Letterman keeps repeating the punchline. 
Dennis called me and said, hey, you know, that was great. Letterman kept, and I was like, oh, great. And then he said, he said that, I, you know, I'm doing this talk. I'm leaving Saturday Night Live. I'm doing this nightly talk show. And I have my writers, but I'll pay you if you want to write stuff, stay in New York. And I was pretty busy doing stand-up. So the idea of, you know, just writing in the morning and send stuff in and get paid, like, yeah, I'll do that. So I did that for probably two weeks. And all of a sudden, I was like in Buffalo and I got a, like the front desk person, the woman goes, there's a Dennis Miller on the phone for you. And I'm like, what? And he's like, hey, yeah, one of the writers is moving on. You know, we need somebody. Would you come out? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And he's like, I go, when? He goes, well, I'd like to start Monday. I was like, well, tonight's Saturday. I'm in Buffalo. So I literally drove down to New York, back home, New York City on a Sunday and flew out, you know, I think Sunday night, got there, stayed in the friend's couch. And that was my transition to writing, you know, in Hollywood, getting inviting there. We did that show for six months. It got canceled. But, you know, he liked what I was doing. And then I became the head writer for the HBO show when it started and, and eventually executive producer. So, yeah, we had a friendly, have a good business relationship. That's how that kind of started. But really all comes out of stand up. It's an interesting example to, of taking a job and not thinking it's too small to take and that anything can lead into something bigger. Because you could have easily said, you know what, I'm busy. I, I'm not going to I'm not going to write you jokes. And then, you know, I mean. If you felt like you weren't really part of yeah. it or something like that, it's a great story. A lot of people I talk to have things in their background where like they did something and it led to something else that they would never have, have guessed that it led to. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Had to take a quick break. I do want to thank everyone for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations. And that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to my conversation with Eddie Feldman. We're diving into some Dennis Miller. You mentioned the Dennis Miller Live and that you were executive producer, you were showrunner. Uh, but that was that was a big deal, though, right? Because this is where you start winning all your Emmys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a huge deal because this was, wasn't this, this was the first time a primetime cable show wins best show. Right. So that was a big deal. Yeah, it was. I mean... The show came about really because in doing his five night a week show, which, uh, by the way, that was the time when Johnny Carson was leaving. So Carson's leaving and everyone's like, who's the next Johnny Carson? So they give Dennis a show on Tribune that originally was going to go to Gary Shandling, but then Shandling passed on it, but they had this opportunity. So they gave it to Dennis Miller, you know, because he was, uh, you know, doing Weekend Update and big and popular. So. But the secret is that, you know, John, if Johnny Carson's ketchup, good on everything. You know, you can have it every night. Dennis Miller is Tabasco. You only want it, li you know, it's, it's very different. He's not the, even though he's from Pittsburgh, he's not Carson, the Nebraska guy who can make everyone feel at home. His humor is very different. And Dennis does not like that daily. It's, it's a hard job five days a week. There's a lot to it. And so uh, he really didn't take to that. When that show got canceled, and by the way, in my little thing, I get hired the week before Chevy Chase starts. So that's not in the bio. Uh, I, because they needed somebody. They needed writers. And I, I was like, well, I'm starting this HBO show. I can only do 13 weeks. And that's fine. We need somebody. It only lasted six weeks, so it wasn't a problem. But really, you know, the HBO show came about to say, hey, you know, let's take the best of what we did all week and focus it around Dennis. Because that half-hour cable thing didn't exist because HBO didn't exist. It's really time. It's like Carson was on for seven and a half hours, these five nights a week. It's advertiser-based. Well, this was HBO, which was subscription-based. So they were like, well, maybe people will tune in if it's a really special half hour. And so that's how we thought of it. You know, the writers would write, you know, monologue jokes like we were doing a monologue every night, four or five nights a week. And we'd call all those together to the best 10. Use Dennis's rants, which he had just kind of started in his stand-up, crafted in a way that we hadn't seen before, really, to that, you know, where you take a subject and really explore it. Then the guest was, yeah, I remember having arguments even with HBO because the guests were not coming on to promote anything. They'd come on to talk about something they were passionate about. So, yes, we'd mention like, oh, they have a movie, obviously, coming out, but it was more about hey, we taught from the rant over here. And it wasn't always celebrity guests. It was more politicians and other people, public figures. And then the pictures, 
because he did that on uh, Saturday Night Live, where every day we would look at 30 pictures, black and white pictures with like, no, there's no, there's nothing. And you have to come up with stuff. And then we'd put that all together really on a Friday where you'd sit down, take all the stuff. Dennis was living up in Montecito. So I'd fax everything up there with a code. We'd sit for hours where he would just go picture number and a letter of a caption, 16B, 19A and E. <laughs> and I told him, I go, I wonder what your kids are thinking. It's like, it's, you know, you're like, uh, <laughs> you're like in that movie, Donald Sutherland in the Eye of the Needle. You're, you're like, you're on some Enigma code, some guy. Uh, so anyway, that really led to taking that half hour and making the best possible, you know, and making it very different. And so when we did it, we only did the first six episodes. And that first year, we won an Emmy for writing and then won again. And then we ended up winning best show. It was just that people were used to the Carson sit there, talk, hey, and monologue, but this was fairly new. It seemed to work out, and now, now it seems, obviously, you know, then Chris Rock came, was doing it, and that's really become anything subscription-wise the way to go. When Dennis Miller was on Saturday Night Live and the Dennis Miller Live show, I loved, I, I remember watching it, and Dennis Miller was like an early influence on me. Like the yeah. very first comedy thing I ever did, which wasn't stand-up comedy, I worked at a camp. They had a talent <laughs> show. And I said, I'm going to do a news thing. So I did, I basically would did Dennis Miller, but I wrote news stories based on everything going on at camp. And like <laughs> we had like the different characters and stuff like that. So it was this whole thing. I wish it existed on video because it was the first time I ever wrote comedy, but I wrote it as like me as Dennis Miller's type. I mean, it was exactly like that. I mean, I love Dennis Miller. I saw him live in concert. I mean, I was, I was a really big fan till his politics started really, right. really yeah. separating and sort of becoming defining him too much, you know, more than, than his comedy. But I used to always love it when you go, and he just started <laughs> saying these words and you'd be yeah. like, you know, a like pterodactyl, you know, and then you're like, what? What is he, yeah, what did yeah. he just say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He like, I needed to look up every one of his jokes. I mean, but, it was right. like, but you had to pretend you understood him. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and a lot of that, people think like he, oh, he researches the thing. It's not. It's really off the top of it. He just has a deep well of knowledge. So if he doesn't sit there and, you know, like back in the days, like encyclopedia, and it's like, oh, this, you know, it's like, man, nah, it's all there for the pulling. There's a draw there with it. But it is funny because when we would get writers writing for him or trying to write for him, if they were too, you know, it's a caricature, he wouldn't like that. He wouldn't take the joke. It's like it's more like, hey, make this right funny, I'll make it my own. Yeah, but there's a cadence, you know, Carby does such a good, you know, Dennis too. So uh So let me let me ask you this. Is is doing a talk show type format easier or harder, would you say, than like a scripted sitcom where you have the same cast every week, maybe a floating character in and out? You know, with this, yeah. you have different people coming in, the topics Everything seems to it could be like hit or miss, you know, just based on how it get, it just well, resonates yeah. at that moment. Right. Yeah. No, I would say, so going back, if you look at like NBC and Johnny Carson, what he did after all those years, which was basically make it seem like he walked in the door, he had some jokes in his pocket, he could talk to anybody and he went home five nights a week. And because of that, everyone thought, well... That's easy. Why can't we do that? I can do that. But you know what? He was such a master of it, really inventing the format coming from before that to, uh, you know, there was so, so many things he, he started. So when you're starting these talk shows, NBC had an infrastructure. Anytime you go out that, people have no idea. There's executives, you know, they, they don't, and I've never done, this would be, it's one of your first jobs where you talk to the studio that's basically in charge of helping you. And the first thing they say is like, we don't know anything about this. It's like, oh, okay, well, this will be interesting. It looks easy, and that's why it's so hard. And also, you have, for lately, in the past several years, you don't have a lot of time to put it all together. They'll pick a guy or a woman and say, here's the host. In six weeks, you're on the air. You got to hire 100 people, find your writers, figure out the voice, book it, and then it's, it's like, okay, now here we go. And then for a long time, people would then judge that first show and that would make or break. It's like, well, we just started this six weeks ago, maybe eight weeks ago. So it is harder because, and it's harder for executives to get their head around. I've had very smart executives say to me, well, when can we see the first script? And you're like, well, 
this is a topical show. So a lot of the stuff we're talking about hasn't happened. We can give you some things. <laughs> but yeah, this is, a, it's, you know, it's like, well, when will I see the weather? It's like, well, the weather has to happen. And then we show you the weather. Or we could forecast a couple of days where it's scripted. If you think about it, you know, in order to build a scripted show is there's a concept. There's, oh, we see what the concept. Then there's a script. We read the script. We gave notes in the script. We cast the script. Now we know who those are. We, we're going, you know, we're, you know, all through the week, there's readings. There's, you know, we punch up all that stuff. Now we shoot it. Oh, is that the end? No, now we can edit it. Now we, we're putting it together. Here is like, we're coming in at 9 a.m. And at five o'clock, a regular workday, an hour goes out on the air, no matter what. It's out there. And so that's, yeah, that's a, a whole different animal than a scripted. And a scripted has its own issues and, you know, and that problems and other things, that, you know, challenges. But yeah, that's the talk show world of it. You don't know what's happening. And then you got to merge all that sort of stuff. And then you're done and you're like, oh, tomorrow's another day. Let's go. It sounds grueling. It sounds very grueling. Because you got to hope, really, that all this funny stuff happens, right? You you got to find good pictures, like in the Dennis Miller examples, it's especially if, like, when you're doing it, like, once a week. Like, John Oliver does it now once a week, too. Or yeah. It's like you have to kind of... The way things work these days, something happens on a Monday, no one cares on Sunday. Yeah. It's not like things stick around that long. And the references get so lost or dated so quickly. So it's like you have to be kind of scrambling and figuring out what's going to resonate in that episode. And stick. It's got to be yeah. hard. Yeah. Thank goodness you're so good at it. Oh, <laughs> no. Depends on who you talk to. But yeah, John Oliver, I would say, is well, the good thing about that show is because it's not, oh, this, you know, it, it's more, it, you can write it and it's more, I always say, relevant than day and date. So if a relevant show is like, that's still, you know, it's like if something happens, you can, there's ways to deal with it, but it's very relevant because it's about what's happening in the world. And it's opinionated, you know, that helps them. But they're, they're, they do such a great job at it. They do like 39 episodes a year. We did 26. Even after 26, after a while, Dennis was like, what am I mad about this week? Because <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay, here's what we love me. Here's what really upsets you. Here's what these six <laughs> people in the room think is going to upset you. <laughs> so before we get to the third iteration of, yeah. of your working with Dennis Miller, let's go backwards and talk about Chevy Chase. You mentioned Chevy Chase. Uh -huh. What was it like working with Chevy Chase? I mean, his reputation is that he's kind of an asshole. And I hate to say that because I some of my favorite yeah. comedic moments are from Chevy Chase, you know. But what was it like to work with him, especially knowing that this is such a, a high pressure, you know, fast moving type of environment? What was Well, it was interesting because Chevy and I grew up close to each other. I grew up in Sargates. He lived a long time in Woodstock. I kind of knew that. I knew where he was and stuff. So and again, I, I was a last minute thing that I got that job. The head writer that they had didn't feel they were work, was working out. So they brought in some other writers, myself, and then guy Mark Brazil, who ended up creating uh, that 70s show and a bunch of things so that we had worked together. It was a time when everyone looked at late night. And again, who's going to be the next Carson? So it's all this pressure. Chevy, apparently, which I didn't know growing up in upstate New York, was a bit of a dick to people and to the press. So he, you know, constantly kind of dissed them and all through kind of his career. And, and so apparently when he got this talk show, they were kind of gunning for him. That's the, I guess that was part of it. Well, also uh, what I found out too was when they went to Chevy to host this show, he didn't want to do a talk show. He's like, I'm not good at that. I want to do like a, you know, Saturday Night Live, like a sketch show, something like along those lines. And they, I guess Fox would say, yeah, yeah, we'd let you do that. And and I want to work with my friends here. Like, yeah, well, turns out, well, first of all, you can't do a sketch show five nights a week. That's not the format, but he didn't care about that. It's Chevy Chase. So they eventually push him into the type of show that he never wanted to do. So he did, which he, I don't think he cared about. Also, Chevy's a smart guy and somehow realizes that even if the show fails, they got to pay me out for my entire contract. And I think armed with those two things and given all the bullshit that he has to deal with. I don't think he really cared. He wanted to work, but if it didn't, I'd still make nine or $10 million. So what was interesting though, but to me, Chevy was really nice to me. Uh, he knew that I had just started there. I was in, like in an office with other people, like with a copier and he came in and goes, this is your office? And I'm like, well, yeah, this is all the space they had. 
He's like, well, no, this can't be. Come with me. And we walked around the building, which was this theater on Sunset. It's now like a Nickelodeon thing. And, and he was like, well, can this be his office? And then there, there's no space. So he went back and he said to the executive producer, he goes, hey, over the weekend, you got to cut this in half. Get Carpenter in here. Build him a space because he needs an office where he can write. It's like, oh, that, so he did that for me, which was that pretty was cool. Was like, was yeah, cool, yeah, yeah. So, so really, could Chevy have grown into it? Yeah, but that wasn't the time period. The time was deliver or die. And that was the late night world at the time. They're expecting huge ratings. I remember in the green room that night, Rupert Murdoch and Mike Ovitz being in the same like green room with us. And they didn't look happy because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> my second job. I don't know. Is it good, bad? I, I'm just trying to make a living. Again, Fox seems to pull the plug on things. Later, you realize if you look at Kim, Jimmy Kimmel and those shows, it's like you realize like, hey, you just forget the critics. You just got to keep doing the show over and over and eventually... They'll take to it. People will like it, won't like it. But you can't just like, oh, in a month, make it a hit. That's not going to happen. Even Jimmy Fallon needed to grow into yes. his own voice. You know, when he first started The Tonight Show and, you know, he had a little clunk interview with Robert De Niro, right? I mean, it was... <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, it's not. Yeah, because it's the first thing. And, you know, it's all this. Pre Everyone looks at the first sort of thing. But Jimmy, you know, Fallon, you know, that's what he wanted to do since he was in, you know, in high school. That his high school yearbook basically said he wanted to take over for Letterman. You know, he was, um, that was his drive. All these people, you have to have that drive or else, it's, you know, it's so much work. And not just the show, but publicity and all that stuff. Letterman, my friends who worked at Letterman would say that Letterman would get to work to beat traffic. He'd get in at like 4.30 a.m. So he wouldn't have to worry about Connecticut traffic. He goes, and they said, that means that your boss is there five hours before you walk in the door, already gone through the material that you wrote the day before and hates it. So you walk in, it's like, none of this works. And they got to rewrite. And then, yeah, it's like, because he's, he, Leno, those guys are just so, we're so committed to doing that show, those shows. So I don't think Chevy was that guy. <laughs> The only thing I remember from Chevy Chase is, and correct me if I'm wrong, a basketball hoop? Was that part of the set? I think there was a basketball hoop, but also there was a uh, a fish tank. And so that always became the thing of like, never put anything behind you that's more interesting than the host. That was a, a, a rule of thumb <laughs> that came out, out of that. Good lesson. Good lesson. Yeah, so. That's really funny. As I was going through your IMDb, it's always fun to look at IMDb and then remember something that you've totally forgotten. What pops out is you don't know Jack. Oh, uh -huh. and I remember Paul Rubens doing that character, Troy Stevens, you know, and this was a real popular computer game at the time. You yes, don't know right. Jack. And, and so Paul Rubens was the host of the show, but he didn't play Paul Rubens. He wasn't himself. He, he played a character. Yeah, yeah. That was just, that was a nice quick nostalgic thing. I don't remember that being around that long, but it well, was, no, uh, yeah, it only lasted Again, that was that was kind of on a break from my hiatus from Dennis Miller, and I got hired to take to do that show. That show was kind of kicking around a little bit. Other net, some networks had it; they weren't sure what to do with it. HBO had it for a little while. I remember talking to them, so I kind of was a, aware of it. And then, so when I went in to talk to the executive producer, which was Robert Morton, who was you know kind of over from the Letterman show, I was familiar with it, and I was like, oh yeah, and I talked a little about it, and I didn't get. No, I had the job, and he, and he was like, and all of a sudden they like there was a call that said, oh, they want you to go and meet with the executives at ABC, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I walk in the door. Andrea Wong was the well, this woman at the time who ran a, that part of ABC, and I sat there, and then so she looked at me and said, oh, uh, Robert Morton said you had a great handle on the show. What is it? And I'm like, I do. What is? It? I don't know what it is. What did I tell him? And so I had to think <laughs> of my feet. Go. What did I tell Morty? That I, what the show was, because he didn't warn me. He was like, oh, you should want to hear your tape. So luckily, the guy that was with her, her second, got called out of the room. There was something. And it gave me a couple minutes so I could actually think things up and remember what I pitched. So I went back and I was like, oh, yeah, I think we do this. And it was just kind of an improv song and dance. But, uh, but Paul, the far, best part of that was working with Paul Rubens, who I was you know, obviously a big fan of, who was a great guy. Another guy who grew up by me in Pine Plains. To the other side of Woodstock, so he had that to talk about. They wanted him to do it as as Pee Wee Herman. In his mind, it was he's not doing. I'm not doing Pee Wee Herman for it. That's a whole different thing. And he settled on that character. 
And yeah, it was a, it was a summertime kind of replacement. It came on 4th of July, did pretty well. But yeah, it was one of those, well, one season. And I think he went on to do some, I don't think he wanted to do it again. It was interesting to work on it. Yeah, I, I love Paul Rubens. I think he's so funny. Sorry to interrupt. Have to take a quick pause. And we're back. Now, what path led you back to Dennis Miller? Where did Dennis oh, Miller's um, calls you up again? Yeah, I need so, Eddie. Get Eddie on the phone. <laughs> so he, um, so I guess I had done for FX this Orlando Jones show, which was kind of an experiment to take someone like Orlando, who is an actor, and kind of make a sketch late night show. So we did really one season of that, but it was again fraught a little bit. He was he's incredibly talented. It was we we're doing it FX. But then they wanted to transfer it at Fox. It was like this executive back and forth or who's paying for it. So whatever that, you know, it's like, okay, a lesson learned here. It got decent reviews. It really, if they put, again, if Fox put time into it, it probably could still be on the air, but they didn't. So that's their thing. So then Dennis calls me to say that he, CNBC, Jeff Zucker was like, he wanted me to come over to CNBC, but it's four nights a week. And I thought back to the first show, which was five nights a week. This is one night left, and I'm like, less. I'm like, okay. And it was Jeff had was trying to do the talk show and nighttime because CNBC was popular with all the that stuff. So not a big, very small budget, very different. Not a, we had. I think we started with two writers, hardly any staff, and really, again, we're, you're being judged. There's the Tonight Show just down the lot, spending millions of dollars, and then here's this low budget show. Well, it part of TV where, you know, cable and network dissolves into each other and nobody looks at it like, oh, that's cable over here and that's network. It's like, no, they're the same. People at home don't know any difference. So you're kind of judged by, hey, we have, we have like, we don't have an a sort of audience. There's like bleachers, like, like in the high school football game. We had a couple writers. We're in the side building. We didn't even have uh, production assistants when we started. The guy from CNBC said, oh, you don't need those. Don't worry. We have in, in CNBC that, you know, the, the talent just, you know, we just get some, send a writer to get the talent. You don't need anything like that. Well, our first guest was Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're getting we're the first show and it's like, oh, you know, there's a lot going on. How, how everything working. We're testing and things. And all of a sudden we look and Schwarzenegger sitting in, in the interview chair. It's like, who went and get him? got him? We got nobody. He just got tired, bored. He walked out to the set. He's Arnold Schwarzenegger and was sat there. And so that was the way that we got a production assistant because we could say to the CNBC executive, like, see, this is what you can't just have Schwarzenegger wandering around and sitting there. He's, oh, OK. So we, that's how we got our production assistant to help us usher the celebrities. Also, one of the guests on that show was Donald Trump and Melania. Just at the, but not only that, he was out doing publicity and did a somewhat famous interview on a bus on that trip with uh, Billy Bush that seems historically to play into his factor. So that was all in that same little time period. That was, that, as I look back, you're like, 2000, oh. 2004, 2005. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So did you get to meet Donald Trump and Malay? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Said hello and those sort of things. But yeah, came in and it was, I just remember Trump looking at our stage. It's like, what's this? <laughs> no, <laughs> right. Because it's so low budge. It's so low yeah, budge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like he just, you know, you're walking out. He just looked around. There was only half a state. The other half was used for something else. So it just was a small little place. He's comparing you to Mar a Lago. And oh, just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like that's a nice show and things. Yeah. So I think he just gave this look like, you know, what am I doing? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's, and that also, I mean, I think you're leading that way is at that time, Bush was president. Dennis was kind of like, He's always been, as he will tell you, somewhat conservative, but all during Dennis Miller Live, all the writers, when he had, would come in, he'd have some sort of thought, and then the writer would say, yeah, but that can't be true, and he'd take balance the opinions of it. He seemed to, after 9-11, kind of move that way with Bush, and I don't want to make fun of Bush, and that seemed to lead down that road, eventually morphed heavier to the right than he had ever been before. And to be honest, I don't creatively comedy wise you know the that the right is kind of the goliath you know as a comedians you know we make fun of goliaths so it's like where do your targets the poor they go after that that you know homeless not easy targets 
to do that. <laughs> no, I agree with you. Yeah, you got to go for the big guy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that was so the Dennis Miller 2004-2005 Bush era show was his move towards a much more political bent. Yeah. But, you know, before there was always jokes and everything. He, he literally kind of made a choice to, like, you know, not go after Bush. I will say early in his career, he did make certain choices where every comedian, I think it was, what's the guy's name? It was the, was it Stackhouse? There was, um, I'm going to blank on Stack it. But he, Stack? No, no, he, he ran, no, no, he ran for, he, remember he was a, a veteran. He had hearing problems. And oh. then people were making fun of him. I forget. He was the vice presidential choice. And so oh, Dennis for was Perot. Perot for Perot, was yeah. Yeah, I want to say Stockhouse, but I think that's an actor. But he purposely championed him to say Stockdale. Stockdale, yes, that's right. To where it's like, no, I'm not making fun of the guy. He's a hero. I mean, he can't hear because, you know, when he was a prisoner of war, they clapped his they clapped his ears and he broke his eardrum. So I'm not going after him. So that was a choice. It was a good one, I thought. But then later he kind of made more of a choice of like, eh, I don't want to do bush jokes just to do Bush jokes. So, okay. You know, at that, you know, at that point in your juncture, you can only say, okay, we'll do other stuff. Just how. Got it. You know. But yeah. So then that show lasted for two years or a little less than two years. And, but it was a nightly show. It was fun to do. There, you know, there was a great staff on it, like anything. Then that ended. And from there you went on to work with another SNL alum, David Spade. Yeah. The show of his show. So I knew David uh, again from that, whole sort of click and SNL click and Dennis has been on different shows. And um, literally that show had been on a couple of episodes and I got a call from Comedy Central to talk to David and his, I know his management stuff. So kind of went in there first as kind of a network consultant, which was new to me. Again, all these shows are, you're starting up, people are trying to figure it out. There's network notes, there's producer notes, there's David Spade notes. So kind of came in as somebody who'd been doing it before to kind of like, oh, okay, you've been told this, you've been told this, here I think is the right way to go. Let's go, let's try it that way. Uh, you think who's a really talented showrunner and funny comedian I knew for years, started the show, did pilots, and then they brought in David. At that point, it was no longer the You Think created show, it was the David Spade show. So what you have to kind of realize that as a writer and as a producer, like he's the host, everything revolves around him could be david spade could be anybody that's how this stuff works but david's great he's really talented and funny so it was a fun little ride for that i love david spade but i i could see where he, you made the comparison earlier to tabasco sauce with dennis miller i could see like david spade being similar in that sense that his sarcastic snarky style maybe doesn't appeal to literally everybody oh yeah yeah i happen to think he's one of the funniest stand-ups and I've always enjoyed like his rants on SNL when he would do all those Hollywood yeah, minutes and right. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I find him hilarious. But he's, he's gone on to other shows. They seem to, like to what you're saying, not give him enough time to kind of really find his footing. Yeah. And that show was interesting because it's show business. You know, and I had this conversation with Comedy Central, which was, you know, we had done 13 episodes a year. And it's like, well, show business doesn't end because the show is going away on hiatus. Shouldn't this be 26? And he wanted more episodes. That wasn't their business pattern at the time. We tried to talk them into doing more shows. And then what happened was Adam Sandler was starting a sitcom, actually uh, created by this guy, Tom Hertz, who I had first hired and knew as a stand-up for Dennis Miller Live. And so... Spade had a network out in his contract and went to do that because it was a full year and he made more money and more people saw him. So, you know, I think Comedy Central could have easily just said, hey, we want you. We're going to do 22 episodes a year. You know, we want this year round. We'll space it out. But that at that time, that wasn't what they were up to. So he went off to do, um, you know, a sitcom with Sandler, his company. So yours and became the funny Guy who zips in, says some funny stuff, zips out, back. That's his thing. That's awesome. So you, you've you had quite a career in the late night world. You've kind of seen everything. Which ones do you watch now? Where do you, where, where do you spend your time late night right now? Do you, Who's your favorite? Oh, well, my, the quick answer is nowhere. I've done too much of it. Uh, but I will, sam you know, sample. And I think um, Colbert for where, you know, I remember meeting Stephen when he was just going to be starting 
Colbert, you know, the Colbert report and sitting, having, you know, dinner with him. And when he's trying to figure that out and to see kind of uh, how he's taken this arc from uh, playing a character where I'm the, hey, I'm the Republican character to what he's doing at, at, you know, at CBS and all through the Trump era of that, uh, of becoming very opinionated, uh, you know, to me, he has the biggest career arc of like where he was and where he is. Kimmel, again, knowing him from Man Show and things and not from a, as a stand up. I, I think the writing's good. I see what, where, again, don't watch him all the time, but I'm like, oh, amazed of how he's able to morph in there. And then, and Jimmy Fallon is somebody who, when I was doing my first talk show with Dennis Miller and was on the Tribune, on Tribune, and was, had to go and do little, write little sketches myself and played like a, kind of as a Bill Nye, Nye science nerd. I got a package from my mother and a letter from this kid in high school who wanted to be a comedian. And, and it was from Jimmy Fallon because we went to the same high school. You know, he's like, oh, I saw you. I see you on Dennis Miller and your sketches and things. And so, you know, when um, Jimmy was coming up and coming on to the late night scene, I just think it was interesting where what he chose, how, how he chose. And because again, knowing the drive from when he was a kid to wanting to be the host of this thing and making it, I see what he's doing as far as turning that into like what should be your own point of view. So I'll tune in every once to see what he's doing. Uh, you know, the musical stuff, that was kind of where he came out of in that world. And then there's, there's other people we haven't even, you know, talked about like Arsenio and, uh, and those guys, what they've done, what they did. And now like Chris Rock or Jesus and Nero, I think it's like, oh, that people are changing things up again. Sam J. So it's interesting to see how things are morphing and again, changing back from the, I remember I got in trouble when we were doing this Orlando Jones show because the kind of the promo that we wanted to do was no desk, no white guy. And FX got shit for it because they're like, you can't say it, you can't do that. I'm like, well, it's true. We're not using a desk. He's on a couch and there's no, and he's black. So it's interesting to see the world, how now, you know, becoming a little bit more diverse and trying different things. Excellent insights. Thank you. I'm always asleep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So that's why I wanted. I was asking more just so I. Oh no, no, but but again, I'm always asleep. I don't like wait when you say, hey, "What's the state of the late night?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a late. I mean, yeah, I mean, when you think about it, you forget. You're like, uh, there's a show on at one thirty in the morning. It's like at one time when I was doing stand up, but I'd come home and it'd be like, "Oh, I can watch the show at one thirty. Now, you know, maybe I wake up by accident at one thirty. <laughs> right. So, it's, but yeah, it's a it's a different world. But yeah, I think every, all of those guys are doing really great jobs. And I, Let me end on a very important question. Where do you keep your five Emmys? <laughs> oh, uh, well, I, I had kept them in, um, you know, some room were there. And, I, and every once in a while, people walk by and go, hey, what's like, you know, who walks by? Like the plumber on the way to, to fix a toilet in the, in the, in the guest room. But it goes, oh, hey, what, what especially in L.A., because like, hey, what were those for? And then you tell them. So now, now they're in storage because I'm moving. And so I had to put them away. And then so, yeah. I'll, I'll, but the, yeah, they're out. Not, they don't sit in the front part of the house somewhere. But they're, they're there. Somewhere there. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's a big, you know, look, it's, it's one of those things. It's a nice accomplishment. It was really pretty special to win two and walk around the governor's ball with one in each hand. I think yeah. it's an amazing accomplishment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Very cool. You've had an amazing career. Do you have any anything on the horizon? Any, anything you're working on right now? Any? Uh, yeah, I'm working on uh, several things, and um, one of them is with Adam Sandler's company. Is this comedy competition that we've been developing, and that we're looking now in the middle of attaching a host, someone that I spoke about. Uh, I can't say who it is, but I did mention their name in this interview, so you can go back and have some sort of like Pokemon puzzle and see if you can find that. So that's moving along pretty well. I have a, a show with uh, Sutton Foster that I'm really happy about, which is kind of, um, a camp, it's a camp, uh, speaking of camp, Camp Musical High, which is really a kid's kind of mu uh, Broadway competition series. And that's, you know, we should have some good news about that coming up. Yeah, so I, I have that and a bunch of other stuff, but yeah, I keep busy. And then maybe in the late night world, if we keep going, there may be a, 
limited series about, again, somebody else I spoke about, <laughs> late night history. Mysteries, I can't say who rap, it is. and enigmas. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I'm going to hope it's Chevy Chase. I'm oh, yeah. Well, that's... Chevy Chase. <laughs> maybe, maybe, it, maybe it should be. Yeah. Eddie, thank you so much for spending so much time with me. Where can people keep up with you on the social medias? I'm at, uh, on Twitter, Eddie Feldman. I nabbed that moniker. So there, that's kind of the, the most thing. Uh, you know, I don't think people go to LinkedIn, but kind of see what I'm doing there. I'm on Facebook. Very cool. Thank you. I enjoyed this entire oh, Late Night 101. It was amazing hearing everything you were doing. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate it. It was great. I th thanks. All right, everyone. That was Eddie Feldman. So many great stories from all the Dennis Miller shows and how we met Dennis Miller and Chevy Chase and behind the scenes of the Chevy Chase show. Delhi, so much. This episode was just jam packed with everything but mayo. No mayo on this episode. That's how good you know it is. All right. Well, with the interview over, that can only mean one thing. I know the episode is over. Can't believe it either. One more huge thank you to my guest, Eddie Feldman, and a huge thank you to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations.